to, to get some feedback from you tonight what you think about those ideas. But um, uh, perhaps just if you're asking a question, the acoustics are terrible in here, so shout. <laughs> Say a question for both speakers. Um, have you got any examples of conventionally run firms that have converted to co-ops? And any suggestions on you know, how that might be encouraged in New Zealand? Um, I don't know. I don't know that. Go ahead. Okay. Um, in a number of countries, yes, it, it's a very easy suggestion to make. Because one of the problems that a lot of New Zealand businesses have, especially the smaller businesses, what's called um, they call it when, they, when they go on to the next generation, succession planning. So I think you know the, the, it's a very good, the best way to encourage cooperatives to, be, to start within uh, any kind of business is, is to, for the old to have some kind of incentive for the original owner to pass it on to a cooperative, or let's face it, who understands the business better than the people who've been working there for years. And you, have, you can pass it on in such a way that the, um, uh, the, the original owner retains a 40% ownership and the, co the new cooperative owns 60% and gradually they buy them out so they can retire off. And a lot of, a lot of companies have just disappeared. And a lot, of, a lot of experience disappears and a lot of wealth disappears because there's no effective way of changing ownership from one generation to another. So I think a cooperative will be a very good way of doing that. People have been suggesting that in other, in other countries. I believe in Ireland that happens quite a bit. Um, hasn't yet happened here. There's at least one MP who's interested in helping getting that off the ground, so hopefully that we can do something around that. I'd like to just mention briefly, a lot of conversions take place with regards to firms that are, are about to go bankrupt or where the private sector wants to pull out even though the firms are actually profitable. And there are many examples of this in Canada, in the brewery industry, in the pulp and paper industry, and some manufacturing. So basically, workers take over, and very often they'll hire a CEO, a CFO with a lot of experience. A person will be paid a lot of money, but that, that CEO doesn't, doesn't control the company. But, there, but very, in this case, you have a situation where there is an act of desperation in many ways. People want to keep their jobs, and you have a cooperative solution, which typically does work. And I, let me just mention one more thing, is that for a lot of workers, cooperatives, and they represent a risk, and they do. If you're a worker, and you, take, if you work for somebody, you, you risk being unemployed. But if you own a cooperative, it goes broke. You, use, you risk much more than that. So there is a risk in, in being part of a cooperative. I think it's a positive force, but that risk is there and has to be addressed. And that's why the cooperative solution isn't for everyone all the time. But you have these various examples. So, Chris, right here. Thank you. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Oh. Raising the issue of increased productivity as a way to increase quality is fabulous. So, give us a much more positive uh, point of that. That's my comment. Um, I'm involved with a, a small group who constituted themselves on a cooperative society. And a few years ago, I tried to find out more about this and found that. Well, I suppose I should say, for an NGO, most NGOs become charitable trusts because of the tax benefits and so on. And I think it's very hard to have recognition through a charitable society structure. So I'm very keen to ask you what you know about that, what you can tell us about that, whether that is a viable structure in terms of, in, you know, a non-government type of enterprise. Uh, I think what you're talking about is an, an industrial <coughs> economy society. Is that right? Okay. That's how your group is constituted. And it's a 1908 act. It's called a, a, a cooperative society. Okay. Maybe there's a technical layer. You know, the, 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 the law under which it's registered is called the Industrial Product Society Act, 1908. Um, it's quite an ancient law, it's very manual. It's just a way of incorporating. Um, it makes you 
makes you into a business or a providential society. It's quite, it's quite ambiguous. So it really depends on what your, what your group is cooperating around. What makes a cooperative a cooperative in the New Zealand context is you're either selling to it or buying from it. So you can, and then the question was, can you be charitable, have get charitable status as a cooperative? Is that your question? Or? Yeah, well, what, what would be a legal structure for a cooperative society? Because the, the idea of this group was to share the benefits and, you know, to work collectively. It had all the ideas that you set out. But we ended up being a charitable trust as well, because that's how you most really engage with government. Again, okay, it really depends like on the context. In a charitable society, you receive government funds. Okay, well, I mean, cooperatives are not about receiving funds from outsiders. It's really about those individuals who are part of that society or that cooperative um, engaging with the rest of the world. So they, 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 they take part in, in their cooperative by either um, buying from the cooperative or selling to it. So for example, if, if it's a housing co-op, you're actually paying rent to your housing co-op, you're in a sense buying from it. Um, if, you're making, if you're a craft person, you're selling your craft to your co-op, which sells it on your behalf. It's not a charity, a cooperative is not a charitable endeavor. It's, 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 a, it's a business. Yes, like the case, the we were Sorry. eligible to get funds for buildings. Well, uh, yes. again, we can talk about this later, but you know, without knowing the context, it's almost, it's hard to, you know, it's like you're walking on sand here. But, but let me just make one thing quickly. I, I'm not an expert in zero law, but if one has a chair, uh, it's a charitable NGO, a charitable NGO can be run as a cooperative. It, it may not be called a cooperative, run as a cooperative, and that would differentiate it from other NGOs, which are not run as a cooperative, and which are run in a more hierarchical fashion. The other thing I would say about what's the amount of expert New Zealand law, as compared to other countries, it makes no difference if the governments are actually left, right, or center, the New Zealand laws are not as sympathetic to cooperatives as in other countries. And by sympathetic, I don't mean favoring cooperatives but having a level playing field across the board, treating pro so-called profit-maximizing firms in the same fashion as cooperatives, treating mutuals and, and credit unions in the same fashion as private banks. So that, that level playing field isn't here in New, in New Zealand as well. I'm sure that doesn't answer your question. Yeah, right. I think it's really helpful. Well, I've got a couple more questions here. So the gentleman behind you was, I think, had a hand up for him. We've got two more over there, one over there. Uh, mutualising of insurance companies. 
Uh, it, it's looking at New Zealand as um, Morris in particular, perhaps, from a Canadian perspective. Is the system here biased against cooperatives as a result of that type of economic perspective from the 80s? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak like an academic because I haven't, I, I haven't done all the research. But given what I do know, what I do understand, yes, I think the system in New Zealand is biased against credit unions and mutualized type of organizations. And it's interesting that this type of embedded institutional bias took place to a large extent under labor. That's why I so one has to be very careful. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not labor versus whatever. So, but if you have people who are formed by certain economic models, if they think the cooperatives are bad, that's going to hurt the economy because they, they're formed by this notion, well, if you have a cooperative, then you're not properly spreading risks, you're not incentivizing people to invest properly, then it could be bad for the economy. This is how actually the leading investment houses think, the leading uh, well, people like Standards and Poor's, that's how they view, for example, cooperatives and mutuals. It's a bad model, but that bad model informed a lot of decisions in the 1980s. If you can look at Canada, whether you, you look at Alberta, that little Facebook from Alberta, Alberta is considered the most redneck part of Canada. But cooperatives are super powerful, and they're facilitated by the government. And, and the government, it's either conservative, they have uh, credit, there's all sorts of, they have a very weird right wing parties there as well. But the thing is, they all support cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, mutuals, workers' cooperatives. They're not treated disfavorably. And sometimes they're actually subsidized, which I don't think necessarily is a good thing, but nevertheless, there's, that's a big difference between Canada and New Zealand. And there's no reason for this not to change irrespective of government, because even within the national party, there are a lot of people there who are members of cooperatives. So it's really a way of, of, of framing cooperatives as something that's positive. And it's not, it's not, it's not asking for advantages. It's saying, you know, treat us fairly, treat us equally, and, and, and we'll show you what we can do. And, that, and we'll show you how we can benefit New Zealand society. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm intrigued with the thought of the city councils becoming cooperatives. Uh, at the moment, city council elections, nobody has got a very few vote, and there's a lot lack of interest in that, in that, in that, in that. And the possibility of changing the structure to that of a cooperative is one that intrigues me, and I'd love to hear what you might think of the possibility. I know it happened to start and it happened in the UK. Uh, I don't. I haven't read much about what's happening, but you can, they are mutualising council, um, local council delivery of services. They're mutualising schools in the UK. Uh, I, I don't. I can't honestly say that I'm in a number. You have a look on the internet, you'll find lots and lots of information about how they're doing it and how, you know, and also critiques about how well or not. Maybe we can have mutual charter schools. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sorry, we have a couple more questions that are. Uh, I'll get you next and then just in the middle at first place. Yeah, sorry, I'll leave it Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, is there a trend among cooperative businesses when, when they do their pricing and so on to include the effects that their business, for example, they've had on the environment or people around them? I, I mean, I know none of most businesses don't, ordinary businesses don't include that. And I'm just wondering if it's cooperatives do. Like, for example, I don't, um, I know I shouldn't automatically assume that the words cooperative and you're bringing an ethical and so on go together. Like, I don't believe from here are particularly good at looking after the environment and including that, you know, the, the awareness of that in the business. But would you say on the whole that cooperatives um, do are aware of those ethical, well, I think we call it externality. I don't, I don't think one should assume simply because an organization is cooperative that they're going to be greedy. 
or sympathetic to the agreement. I think it depends on the ethical considerations of cooperative members, what informs them. I think my starting assumption, maybe it's very cynical, is that most people are self-interested. I'm not saying that's how they should be, but they are. They're interested not only by self, but they're interested in their families, their friends. But they're not necessarily going to be interested in the environment. So I think the co and but cooperatives can better handle environmental challenges just because how they're organized. But if, but if, co if as a general principle, I think cooperatives need to be need to face the same type of regulations as non-cooperatives. And once they have those regulations in place, then they can better handle a lot of these regulations so as to maintain to be profitable, competitive, and to benefit their members. But I don't think naturally cooperatives are going to be environmentally friendly simply because they're made up of human beings. I mean, this is exactly why I went through the exercise earlier asking whether a cooperative is for the, co the common good or for the good of the individual member. It's a question that needs to be asked by every single co-op co at their formation and whatever they're, you know, and during the course of their life. I can think of an excellent argument for how you bring together a group of armaments manufacturers into a marketing cooperative. Doesn't mean that it's ethical or it's all worthwhile, but it fits the model. It's not one I would recommend, but I mean, it is, so, yeah, ask that question. Chair yeah, Holmes, the board of director, et cetera, and the co-op, especially before when you referred to members being able to accrue shares and then sell their shares. Okay. Um, when you join a cooperative, you buy a share. Now, every cooperative is going to define how much that share is or how old, or old it is. Um, and the thing is that when you leave the cooperative, you get your share back. But, so it's, that, that's, that, 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 that's the starting point. Some co-ops, when they look at how much they've made at the end of the year, are going to say, well, we want to pay out this much to members, but we need to retain earnings within the co-op for the business to for next year's planning. So we're going to give our members half the money back in cash and half in, um, in either increasing the share, value of shares, or give them some more shares. So for some co-ops, you might start off by paying $100, and then as you go through your years of using the co-op, at the end of year 10, you found you've got 1,500 shares, because that's what the co how the co-op is allocated its rewards to you for your participation in the co-op. So that's the same as a normal business so far? Yeah. Uh, I don't know that it is, because in a normal business, you, you don't get shares called your participation. So for example, so the, allocation of the, shares. the allocation of shares is nothing to do with your investment, your financial investment, but how much you use the co-op. So for example, if it's an olive oil co-op, and you've got 100 trees and I've got 1,000 trees, we get paid the same price for our olives and the oil that's produced, but I've got, a I've got 10 times more trees for you so that my, my, I get 10 times more for my reward for my olive oil. At the same time, at the end of the year, when the surplus is being divided up, I still get 10 times more than you do because I have to supply more olive oil, olives, to the cooperative. So it's based on how we use the co-op, not what we invest in it. And what we accumulate over the years then depends on how much we've used that co-op. And there's many different ways that co-ops work in, in, in how they do that. Some, for example, you just, you, you just buy a share and that's it. And you, at the end of the how you know, when you retire, you get that share back. But others do, do reward you in different ways. From a standard business, you can invest with arm's length without having to use the co-op, the, the business uh, at all, whereas in co-op. So it has to be proportional to your use of the co-op. Uh, but basically, there's absolutely no point in investing in a cooperative share if you're not going to use the co-op. Presumably, I'm, you couldn't. What? Presumably, you couldn't invest in the co-op if you're not going to Well, no, not really. I mean, for example, if I were to go up to farmlands and OTAC and say, hey, I just bought myself a, a lifestyle block, I want a farmland share, for this, and I say, okay, $500. And actually, I don't have a lifestyle block at all if I don't use farmlands. And at the end of the year, I've got nothing. You know, I've got, I've got no no record. I don't get share of profits. So it doesn't matter that I've got a five hundred dollar share to join the farmlands, the, the farm to wipe out. I'm not used it, so I don't even front back. To it. If I'm a big user, so I get a large share of the profits. So cops about being about rewarding you on an equitable basis, not an equal basis. So the co-op might raise capital on its own, but that would be nothing to do with the rewards of the business. Um, 
When you say a cult raises capital on its own, I'm just trying to look for the defining difference. <laughs> oh, the defining difference is well, okay. If you're in, if if, if, if you um, if, if the local dairy, the, lo the local corner shop was to um, ask for investment, share investment, you might invest in that local shop, but you'd never go in there and use it. So what you're doing is you're getting a financial reward at the end of the year based on your investment. But the cooperative, a cooperative like any other business, needs capital to work with. So mm -hmm. members are up, well, potential members are asked for, to buy a share or shares in order that the cooperative has enough capital to, to get off the ground and to run. But it doesn't reward you for the ownership of those shares. It only rewards your, your, your participation during the year by, by buying from it or selling to it. That's, that's just mention the same really quickly. Uh, another important aspect of cooperatives in terms of compared to the regular firm is the people who own the shares of cooperatives are the people who control the cooperative. You can't sell your shares on the stock market to make value on your shares as people bid prices up and down. You make, you, you make money based on how well you, your co-op is doing. So the, the, the incentives that the forces on the firm or the cooperative is to keep it is to keep an eye on the the basic structure on the firm, the the meats, the meat and the potatoes, or your vegetarian, your uh, I don't, apples and potatoes. Whereas if you're simply looking on the value of your stock, you might do things that might damage the the core of your of, of the firm simply because it's it, it raises the, the stock price in the short term. So that's another important distinction between a cooperative and a regular type of share, share control firm. Um, so I also wrote in front of us for what I'll come to you next, I promise. Well, I don't want to take questions, I'll ask too. <laughs> Bit of a, a bit of a bias point. 
but it's up to the cooperative to have that concern for community. Some have it more than others. I've got the first question. Let's just put that some look like the second one. Yeah, the Fonterra. That's about it. Yeah. Sorry, Marcel. Yeah, just first of all, on, on Fonterra. That's an interesting question. Uh, first of all, Fonterra it does face open competitive markets in agriculture, as compared to farmers in Canada, for example, which are, who are heavily protected. So there's some discipline there. But farmers of Fonterra aren't going to be na naturally sweet on consumers. They're interested in making money for themselves, having benefits for their members. And in, ter in terms of the prices charged, well, it, it's also more complicated because they sell to retailers who charge high prices. So there's, so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting mix. The main point is, co uh, cooperatives, producer co cooperative, will I can do the best to maximize the returns to their members. This does not necessarily mean consumers will benefit. It really depends on how competitive the market is. But one thing for sure, farmers are well, way better off with a, with a cooperative than they would otherwise be. But for, with consumer protection is something else. Consumers then have to organize. They have consumer retailers. That's how they protect themselves. In terms of the history of cooperatives, I think for the most part, we don't come from a cooperative point of origin. I think we, we talk about slavery, we talk about serfdom, we could talk about lords and nobles. Those weren't cooperative societies, those were villages, those were towns which were, which were typically dominated by some very, very often, I won't say often, very often by very nasty tyrants. And they, and they forced a certain type of cooperation amongst the villagers, etc. But that wasn't true cooperation, as Ramsey discussed it, in terms of the principles of sharing. And, and respect and, and trust. I just want to add one last thing. The cooperative is actually undergoing a bit of a revival at the moment, not just in New Zealand but globally. And I think that's a result of the global financial crisis. Uh, I think we can see quite clearly that cooperatives rise during times of crisis after the 1929 um, uh, stock market crash. We saw uh, quite, a, quite a large rise in cooperatives, particularly in America, as well as around the world. I think I predict we will see a rise of more. In cooperatives, and so if you're, if you're wanting to do something in the Wellington region, just come and talk to me and let's, let's see what we can get off the ground. I'm coming up, I said we're finished at half past seven, so I think we've probably got only time for one or two questions. So, well, in some ways, you must be over there because the international cry from the UN is because of the economic crisis to look at being at the end of the world. But I was particularly interested in that. I think, with one exception, you talked about growth. Economic growth didn't come up all the time. I was at Rio, and Rio was about sustainability, but it was also supposed to be about being growth. I'm not sure they all go, they go together very well. Because if you have economic growth with an increased population, we are going to use more and more resources. And what I find so fascinating, and then reinforce that, is that the cooperatives seem to have a lot of sustainability. As we say, you see, what, 18 years in America as opposed to. Seven. Now, I was into, I happened to know there was a, I think LAP had a big conference here this weekend, and they had a, a dinner on Friday night for what they call the 25 year club. And I asked, what is the 25 year club? It is people that have worked for or are agents, for, because it's not really a mutual benefit society now, I don't know if it's anything, yeah. um, for at least 25 years. And most of them have been there 40, and it was about 100. Now, that is rare today. And I thought, how exciting. An organisation that at least began in, in 1849, I think, in Australia, um, still had some sort of sustainability, because that's what we really need. Some kind of security, some kind of long term. Yes, we do have to change. We're not going to be the, the crafts, most of those crafts you listed in 1700, some don't exist today. But it is at least something, a group of people that are trying to keep going. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Any comments for that? Yeah, I, I have a quick comment. One with regards to sustain, environmental sustainability. Actually, I think if 
looking at an increasing number of, let's say, different types of economic research, I think you can have a greener economy and growth. You can. It's just that a lot of firms resist it. A lot of this has to do with ignorance, lack of knowledge. But if you look at com companies that are heavy, are, are very effective, and they are, for example, in the United States, although people don't necessarily want to believe it, it's true. They are very competitive. They've been forced to innovate. And although New Zealand, although New Zealand's also a big polluter, but the United States remains a big polluter, but the extent to which it's polluting has dropped dramatically per person. Yeah. So 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 that's just what well, that's just what I know you may have disagree, but that's what it's the term growth is being the driving force, which is still there. No, yes. well most people, most poor people want to be better off. And that's part of the human condition. Well, I most think. poor people want a job that they can have some sort of guarantee. Which means better off. But the other, the other thing is in terms of uh, change. I'll give you one example in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, where I live in quite a while in Western Canada. Cooperative grocery stores were the most ugly grocery stores you could ever imagine. And they were like green, really gross. They, you know, they, 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 they didn't want to serve uh, expressos or cappuccino. They thought that was just for the hippies and the yuppies and bourgeois or whatever. But they were going to go broke because they had to face competition from Safeway and Walmart and Costco. Then they started to innovate. It was a big fight, but the because uh, the younger ones won, and they, and they started bringing up the cost. They just they looked nicer than Walmart or Safeway, or at least just as nice. They had organic food, which a lot of co op members didn't want to have. Didn't want to. That's disgusting. But they had all these weird vegetables and fruits. They painted everything up. They looked really pretty. Now they can compete with Walmart. They're right next to Walmart. And they're doing better business than before. So change is important. Change is important. And, and that's one way of sustaining cooperatives over time. Well, I think we'll have to um, bring that to close um, the formal part anyway. Um, I'm sure you have many more questions. Um, um, housing cooperatives are mentioned in passing, and I'm really personally really interested in the issue of why we don't have more housing cooperatives in New Zealand, but perhaps that's a discussion we can have afterwards. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, thank you all for coming tonight um, and invite you to um, join uh, an ongoing conversation because this is a question we're asking. We're looking at the situation in New Zealand. Uh, Morris showed you the graphs of that growing inequality in New Zealand. Um, um, uh, Ramsey suggested that part of the reason why inequality isn't quite as bad as here as perhaps in some other parts of the world is because of the contribution that cooperatives have made to um, moderating that. We've also heard about how in the, um, in the 80s and the 90s and the neoliberal reforms were brought in, there's a kind of bias against cooperative um, forms of financing to emerge. And it's really interesting to look to think now what can we do in response and what role can cooperatives play? in uh, um, raising people out of poverty and I guess the debate I look forward to having is just um, about that whole redistributive um, role that cooperatives play. I would suggest them that I would personally feel that in a developed country like New Zealand cooperatives are quite strong on the redistribution side and not so much about um, lifting people out of absolute poverty. And so, um, but I'm sure we'd have a wonderful debate about that and I'm not an economist so I'd probably lose. <laughs> Um, but I'd say, like to say thank you very much, uh, Morris and Ramsey. Um, and in the spirit of cooperativeness, um, I do have uh, kind of a little gifts of thank yous for you because I've been involved in the fair trade movement. Uh, I am involved in the fair trade movement. And the fair trade movement is built on cooperatives and is a, a classic example of how cooperative business does lift people out of poverty. And there are thousands of stories around the world about how cooperatives have worked for people in really desperate situations to discover their power and to discover their ability to, um, to grow their well-being and their economic strength. So we've got some, um, uh, actually got, Sam might be able to give it to me. We've got a bit of uh, fair trade uh, coffee and uh, chocolate for you as a thank you. I'm afraid I couldn't rustle up any fair trade wine, but I thought you might like a bottle of wine as well as a thank you. So if you'd like to say